being introduced twice. <laughs> yeah, three times maybe. Um, such fun here, so great. And I, many, many thanks to Wyatt <coughs> for putting me with, with uh, Sydney again this year. Uh, we were together last year in our workshop and she's just great. Um, and also many, many thanks for the class we have because Sydney and I agreed on, like on the first day that this was gonna be a really good one and it has been. It's just been so fantastic and I'm having a lot of fun. Um, so much fun, I'm going to read some poems to you. Uh, uh, this is the alternate list here. Um, let's see, where do I have this? Yes. Oh, yes, right. Where is poem number six? <laughs> 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 Okay, so they have this uh, big show at the Getty Museum in LA on books of ours, those medieval uh, books that the aristocracy owned only they could possibly afford them, that they get around with them and uh, use as a prayer book or to guide them morally through the day. Um, <clears throat> so my wife and I go to this exhibit and they have uh, one of the docents who's you know going to guide us through the exhibit. And it <laughs> it's this young girl, and she, she, she got there late. She got there like 10 minutes late, and her hair is all frizzed out. And she has, she's peculiarly happy when she, <laughs> uh, but I mean, it's a particular kind of happy face that I immediately associated with a certain source of happiness. <laughs> And, uh, and my imagination just kicked into gear immediately, and I had a whole narrative already in my head. Um, she was so sweet. She got there late. We're, uh, yeah, we're right on the uh, uh, Pacific Coast Highway, and, and so for me, she had, she had a rich boyfriend who owned one of those beach houses, and <laughs> they had made love all night, and <clears throat> in the morning, they're sitting there at breakfast, you know, with a nice breakfast, black coffee and white cups. And they're looking across the table at each other all goofy. And uh, yeah, and she looks down at her watch and she has to run out and, and she still has that happy face on. So <laughs> um, anyway, this describes, it's her narrating here and it has a lot of details about the making of well, a few details about the making of books of ours. Um, but my sense of this is filtered through my sense of why she's so happy. The book of ours. <clears throat> like the blue angels of the nativity, the museum patrons hover around the art historian who has arrived frazzled and limp after waking late in her boyfriend's apartment. And here, she notes, the procession of St. Gregory, where atop Hadrian's mausoleum, the angel of death returns, his bloody sword to its scabbard. And staring down at the marble floor, liquid in the slanted silver light of mid-morning, she ponders briefly the polished faces of her audience, seraphim gazing heavenward at the golden throne, or as she raises her tired eyes to meet their eyes, the evolving souls of purgatory, bored as the inhabitants of some fashionable European spa sunbathing on boulders. And here, notice the lovely treatment of St. John on Patmos, robed in blue and gold. And she tells the story of gall nuts, goat skins dried and stretched into vellum. The word vellum, delicious in its saying, caressed in her mouth, like a fat breakfast plum, lapis lazuli crushed into pools of ultramarine blue and gold foil hammered thin enough to float upon the least breath. The scribes hastily scraping gold flakes into ceramic cups, curling their toes against the cold like her lover stepping out of bed in that odd, delicate way of his. 
wisps of gold drifting like miniature angels onto the scriptorian's stone floor and dog's teeth to polish the gold leaf as transcendent in its beauty, she says, as the medieval mind conceived the soul to be. The patrons are beginning to wander now as she points to the crucifixion scene done to perfection by the Limburg brothers, the skull and bones of Adam lying scattered beneath the Roman soldier's horse, and the old custodian wipes palm prints from the glass. The monks breathe upon their fingertips and pray against the hard winter, and the art historian recalls the narrow shafts of light tapping the breakfast table, the long curve of his back in half shadow, the bed's rumpled sheets lifted by an ocean breeze as if they were the weight weightless gold leaf of the spirit. Um, <clears throat> Uh, actually, though this is a fairly recent poem, I read this one last year as well, and I don't care. <laughs> uh, Do I have water? Thanks. Uh, actually, when I came out in the book, um, the title was What He Said, and I was never, never satisfied with the ending, so I thought, about, so I thought up a new ending, and now it's called What He Said, What She Said. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is for, I think anybody uh, ought to at least one time in their life be able to say whatever they have to say perfectly, you know. There are so many times. Some of those times might be marital conversations <laughs> uh, in which even better than having the last word is having the perfect word. That means that he, she will never forget it, so you may be doing yourself more damage than you think. But anyway, every, you know, we've all been frustrated by that. We just didn't have, oh, you know, m literally millions, I'm sure, of North Carolina Duke fans in an argument. One of them has wished so badly to say it perfectly so that the other person actually shuts up. You know. um, <clears throat> so anyway, this is a life in the... In the this is a day in the life of a, a guy back in my hometown long ago. Uh, and it was a sort of a glorious time when uh, there was uh, an actress named Bridget Bardot. Uh, I happened to usher a lot of the Bridget Bardot films because I was worked as an usher and I worked in the, the bad theater, small towns in Kansas, you have the good theater and the bad theater. Uh, and. Uh, and I became more popular then because I would, could, you know, tell my friends the Bridget Bardot movie was coming and they could get down and see it before the Baptist minister called the movie theater and had the film <laughs> removed. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, but he, he is uh, so gaga over Bridget Bardot that there is a girl named Candy Bellmeister who is... Uh, uh, ragging him all the time about it, making fun of him and so forth, and he does not yet have the words to say back to her, but in this instance, he finally has them. Um, <clears throat> what he said, what she said. When Candy Baumeister announced to us all that J.D. was in love with Bridget Bardot, Drawing those two syllables out like some kid stretching pink strands of double bubble from between her teeth. J.D. chose not to duck his head in the unjust shame of the truly innocent, but rather lifted it in the way of his father scanning the sky in silent prayer for the grace of rain abundant upon his doomed soybeans or St. Francis blessing sparrows or the air itself eyes radiant with truth and Jesus, and said, baby doll, I would walk on my tongue from here to Amarillo just to wash her dishes. <laughs> uh, 
There is a time in the long affliction of our spoken lives when among all the verbal bungling, stupidity, and general disorder that burden us like the ragged garment of the flesh itself, when beneath the vast and articulate shadows of the saints of language, the white dove of genius with its quick wild wings has entered our souls, our immaculate ignorance, and we are at last redeemed. And so is conceived and born the thing said finally well, nay perfectly. As it might be said, okay, I have to do it over. And so it is conceived and born the thing said finally, nay perfectly, rather like the way it issued from the thickly lipstick mouth of Candy Bellmeister when she replied, baby doll, I've got a sink full of dishes. <laughs> Why don't you wash and I'll dry and then we'll do it again. If you have trouble with metaphor, you just completely missed that. <laughs> that point, yeah. Let's see. Um, This is called A Starlit Night. All over America at this hour, men are standing by an open closet door, slack slung over one arm, staring at wire hangers, thinking of taxes, or a broken faucet, or their first sex, the smell of backseat naga hide, the hush of a maize field like breathing, the stars rushing, rushing away. And a woman lies in an unmade bed watching the man she has known 21, no, could it be? 22 years. And she is listening to the polonaise climbing up through radio static from the kitchen where dishes are piled and the linoleum floor is a great gray sea. It's the A-flat polonaise she practiced endlessly never quite getting it right, though her father, calling from the darkened TV room, always said, beautiful kiddo, and the moon would slide across the lacquered piano top as if it were something that lived underwater, something from far below. They both came from houses with photographs, the smell of camphor in closets, board games with missing pieces, sunburst clocks in the kitchen that made them each morning a little sad. They didn't know what they wanted. Every night, every starlit night of their lives, and now they have it. And uh, I <clears throat> gave a reading in which I read that and a woman came up afterwards and she said, I think that poem is so romantic. <laughs> And I said, I thought, I didn't say it. I thought, well, you're in trouble, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Oh, man, I forgot to put my... So, as soon as I put this up here, somebody will call me from Southern California offering me an ins insurance policy. <laughs> Time has gone by fast. Look at that. I can't believe that. Cannot see. No, okay. Uh, these are not my right glasses, by the way. <laughs> uh, I broke my good glasses, and this was the pair of glasses I had before I had to go get good glasses. 
Um, this is called the Cottonwood Lounge, um, and it's four boys, um, you know, uh, between semesters at college, and they're sitting around talking, and one of them is a uh, <clears throat> really good in mathematics. And he's trying to explain to them an idea of the uh, 19th century mathematician George Cantor, who was into um, <clears throat> exploring the mathematics of infinity. Uh, not that it's relevant to the poem, but he would come up with a, a concept for it that seemed to satisfy the demands of the subject. And then he would have to be taken to the mental hospital, and then he would come back, <laughs> think up a new theory. And he had this idea of, um, oh, for God's sakes, Pete, transfinite, yes. Transfinite sets, uh, and I cannot possibly explain them to them except, explain them to you except that they, uh, he had an idea that some infinities were larger than others, right. Um, and so this kid, they're sitting around drinking, uh, I don't know why in the hell we ever drank this stuff, but it was hip somehow to drink uh, uh, beer with tomato juice in it. So they're <laughs> <laughs> other other. <laughs> other than that, they're perfectly intelligent boys. <laughs> um, but this is in a small town and. Uh, yeah, it's in a place called the Cottonwood Lounge, which is the uh, title of the poem. Um, actually, I have read this actually in, uh, I don't know, like New York City. And somebody would come up to me and say, I guess thinking that people in Kansas don't read books or anything. <laughs> but they would say, I don't believe any of that, that that guy was, uh, you know, that they're sitting around talking about transfinite concepts from George Cantor. And... Um, and it kind of upsets me, and so I just want to reassure you, the guy explaining actually was one of my buddies in college, and he later received a PhD in math from Caltech at the age of 24. Another one in the group uh, went through Harvard Law School and uh, has made a shitload of money. Um, <coughs> uh, one of them, though, is a, uh, yeah, a, uh, a rock musician who's flunked out of Texas A&M which is pretty hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, the four, and, the, and the fourth one is me. And the epigraph to it is uh, <clears throat> uh, from uh, St. Augustine's City of God, which I will read twice to you. Uh, it must follow that every infinity is, in a way we cannot express, made finite to God. It must follow that every infinity is in a way we cannot express, made finite to God. Let's see if there's anything else I need to explain. Um, no. Four boys drinking tomato juice and beer for God knows why. Smoke from Paul Malls guttering and the floor's red sawdust. The talk, the kind of mindless yak that foams up when summer is wearing down. And Campbell is already deep into canter, canter and won't shut up, lining up coronas to the table's edge to indicate, quote, infinite progression. Just imagine they go on forever. But Travis, the sad one, the maniac who flunked out of A&M playing bass in pickup bands and chasing girls, just isn't having it and says, but the edge, Campbell, is there and always will be. And Iris says, please, asshole, just imagine. <laughs> and so it goes, integers, sets, transfinite sets, coronas filling the table because, quote, with infinitely small coronas, this table becomes, my friends, an infinite space within finite limits. And Travis, lip-syncing the doors break on through, has carved Ira Campbell is a dick into, <laughs> into the soft, lacquered tabletop. And time, illusion, though it may be, argues Ira, is walking past the table in the form of Samantha Dobbins, all big hair and legs and brown eyes, 
like storms coming on, who I would date that summer and leave behind and regret it even now. For a time when its linear progression, real or not, is, I fear, terribly finite, as it is for God, who looking up, down, or up, or from some omnidirectional quantum point in this one universe among many, <clears throat> and suffers the idiocies of four beer-stunned boys stumbling in the long confusion of their lives toward what one might call the edge that is there and always will be. For three have already found it, and the one who has not ponders the mathematics of the spirit and Ira Campbell, who found God there. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Uh, I have a poem that I want to dedicate to all of the, well, all the writers here, especially the poets, especially the poets in my particular workshop, uh, because many of them, very many of them are going through the torture of submitting book manuscripts to competitions where you put down 20 bucks and you send your manuscript in to some judge. And um, the thing is, if, you, if it's a really good manuscript, uh, that doesn't mean it's going to be accepted. That means it's going to be a runner-up like 30 times in a row. Or at least that was what I was experiencing at the time I wrote this. Um, it can be really emotionally taxing to have to go through that, and I understand it. I've been there. Um, so that's what this poem is about. Let's see. Actually, there is a reference. Yeah, I'm really beginning to feel old when I do old poetry readings because I have references in here that I have to explain because they were from like maybe 30, 40 years ago and they're no longer recognizable. This is simply, yeah, it's a reference to Jules and, Jack, uh, Jules and Jim and One-Eyed Jacks, which is just two of my favorite movies of all time, uh, but they're old movies. <clears throat> okay, uh, yeah, I just, uh, for, I don't know, I stopped counting I, after 20 actually, but uh, my manuscript has been, you know, was the runner-up on this particular day, and I, uh, there's a poet in Nebraska named Don Welch um, who told me one time there's only one emotion you cannot express in poems, and that's self-pity. I totally understood that. Yeah, that seems like the right way to look at it, except this day, <laughs> <laughs> I was really pissed off and, <laughs> and bitter. And, um, and so I, I decided, yeah, screw it. I will write a poem about self-pity. The thing about writing, expressing self-pity is that you begin laughing at yourself almost immediately. So anyway, this is, this is especially for all the poets here who are trying to get through the competitions and get a manuscript published. It's called Luck. I sit looking into the mirror at the bitter man sitting opposite me whose book has been rejected for the last time. The familiar face I have never liked, the mournful eyes, mournful even in happiness, broken mouth, nose like a fig, the melancholy face of a man whose gift of perseverance I have admired, though now he disappoints me. <laughs> As I watch the blue bile of self-pity welling up in drab, sad little lunettes below his eyes. I begin to think, I'm lucky, I am lucky, to live in a country where the son of a machinist can piss away his time writing poems. <laughs> and I think of that odd word, lucky, its strange sound, the uck sound of a duck barfing, or even, or even, even choking to death. <clears throat> it's ridiculous web feet fanning the air, writhing, uck, uck, 
or the miserable queer sound of galoshes unstuck from the mud, uh, the sound of disgust at the vile, sick, nasty, repugnant, the blackened lemon stuck under the fruit bin, uh, the gross, the foul, the lucky, rhyming with fuck e as it, <laughs> as in fuck Everett, written in dust on the back of a semi hauling dog food to Peoria, <laughs> or painted in dayglow on the water tower by E's acne-ridden rabid ex-girlfriend. But there is, on the other hand, Lucky's lovely L sound, preferred by Yeats among all phonemes, called a liquid and cited in all the intro to poetry texts for its melody, its grace, its small-breasted, skinny-hipped, lithe evocativeness. L, the Audrey Hepburn of consonants. <laughs> As in lily, ladle, lap, lip, lust, labia, loquacious, or lucky. Hail, good fortune attend thee, Horatio, you lucky bastard. Or, good luck, Leonard, I hope you get lucky. <laughs> or the word being implicit in the deed, therefore the very act, the event of luck. The sun coming out in the fifth inning, a $10 bill falling out of the dryer, the tragic diagnosis reversed, Jules and Jim and one-eyed Jacks back to back, no school, a cool summer, a warm winter, the big beautiful book containing 20 years of poems with your name on them. <laughs> Lucky, a stupid word, a wrong word, easily used, badly understood, the tiny pathetic wet dream of me and Everett and that whole town surrounding a water tower where a girl stands with phosphorescent green paint dribbling down her wrist, mumbling luck, Oh, luck, just a little, just some luck. Yeah, I had a, <clears throat> a kind of a long poem not a kind of long poem, a, a real long poem, uh, that I was going to finish with, but I just, I don't have time for it. Um, so, uh, did we start late? Did we start really, really late? Yes. Okay, uh, and this is kind of an experience, uh, ex experiment. Um, yeah, and another thing is, and it's not like I'm mystic or anything, but I'm actually getting a real party vibe from the crowd. Because of that, because of that, I'm not going to read you the long, long poem I w was going to. But actually, there are three or four people have actually requested a long-ish poem. Uh, for me to read um, that I will do. And that poem is called Beauty. Okay. Because I didn't have it on the list, I have to look around for it. 61. Uh, I think I read this here two years ago. And once again, I don't care. Yeah. 16. 16. Um, thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, smart ass. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, this is a poem that's about many things. It's certainly about the word beauty. It's certainly about what is implicit in the fact that I just never heard this word spoken, but not only by anybody in my family, any man in my family, 
but that I don't remember hearing it spoken by anybody in that little town that I grew up in. It's about other things as well, uh, but for me, mainly because of what happened in the end, that is the metaphor that just, uh, yeah, as Mark said, was a moment of grace, just flew into my head. I've, I concluded, <coughs> after I'd completed it, that it was about uh, alien, uh, <coughs> about the price of being alienated from, we all know that it's mentally unhealthy to stay alienated from someone you once loved, but I think it's also unhealthy to be alienated from a place, a place you once loved. And by the time I was, uh, I mean, I sp my whole high school was just waiting f to get to the university, and I left the small town the way many uh, smart-ass kids do. Um, I mean, I felt like I was being denied life itself, you know, and so I wanted to get out of town, and I did get out. Uh, it took me th three days after graduation to sober up and get to the University of Kansas, which was 400 miles away. Um, and uh, anyway, something happened at the end of the poem. Something that had happened during the poem, I guess, that um, somehow reconciled me with the place where I grew up. Uh, there are some things I need to touch on here. Um, there's a reference to Marlon Brando again. I think it's a sin against humanity. I have to explain who Marlon Brando was. Somehow I have the idea everybody in this crowd knows who he is, though. Um, yeah, this happened in uh, the machine shop I had worked in since I was about 10 years old. Um, and um, uh, this, well, I mean, what happened in the machine shop on this particular day was so strange. But it was so strange because it's for that particular part of the country. It's, it was not just strange, but it seemed impossible, but it did, in fact, occur. Um, what other allusions? Because I wasn't really prepared to read this. Um, what other things do I need to explain? Well, there's a reference to the Kennedy assassination. Um, I have to tell you that, yes, uh, it has a narrative frame to it. Uh, my wife and I are at the Bargello Museum in, in Florence, and uh, we're there, we are there to see Donatello's David. Um, I have to warn you, there's some insensitive language in this poem. I guess that's it. <coughs> um, so anyway, we start out in the Bargello, and then it goes to the machine shop, and 90% of the poem is in the machine shop, and then we're back in the Marge Bargello Museum at the end of the poem. Um, and um, yeah, there's also a reference to Hart Crane. I assume everybody knows he was homosexual, and he committed suicide by drowning himself in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I think that's it. Oh, yes, there's a reference to to VD, uh, what's it called now? Okay, right, 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 okay. <laughs> okay, um, I, don't think, I don't think this poem, uh, actually you're making a point about how, how literature comes out of other literature, how literature makes later literature possible at all. And, and even though this happened, this is an experience, it really happened, uh, I don't think that I would have been able to write it had James Wright not, be, not written Autumn Begins in Martin's Ferry, Ohio. And so i uh, just read you two lines from that, which is the epigraph to the poem. Therefore, their sons grow suicidally beautiful. It's in four parts, and I'll just uh, uh, wait a little bit between, between the parts. We are at the Bargello in Florence, and she says, what are you thinking? And I say, beauty, thinking of how very far we are now from the machine shop in the dry fields of Kansas, the treeless horizons of slate skies, and the muted passions of roughnecks and scrabble farmers, drunk and romantic enough 
to weep more or less silently at the darkened end of the bar out of what else? Loneliness, meaning the ache of thwarted desire of, in a word, beauty, or rather its absence. And it occurs to me again that no male member of my family has ever used this word in my hearing or anyone else's except in reference perhaps to a new pickup or a dead deer. This insight, this backward vision, first came to me as a young man as some weirdness of the airwaves slipped through the static of our new Motorola with a discussion of beauty between Robert Penn Warren and Paul Weiss at Yale College. We were in Kansas eating barbecue flavored potato chips and waiting for Father Knows Best to float up through the snow of rural TV in 1963. I felt transported, stunned. Here were two grown men discussing beauty, seriously and with dignity, as if they and the topic were as normal as normal topics of discussion between men, such as soybean prices, or why the commodities market was a sucker's game, or Oklahoma football, or Gimpy Nederland almost dying from his hemorrhoid operation. <laughs> they were discussing beauty and tossing around allusions to Plato and Aristotle and someone named Pater, and they might be homosexuals. <laughs> that would be a natural conclusion, of course, since here were two grown men talking about beauty instead of scratching their crotches and cursing the goddamn government trying to run everybody's business. <laughs> Not a beautiful thing, that, the government. Not beautiful, though a man would not use that word. One time, my Uncle Ross from California called my mom's, mom's Sunday dinner centerpiece lovely, and my father left the room. <laughs> Clearly troubled by the word lovely, <laughs> coupled probably with the very idea of California and the fact that my Uncle Ross liked to tap dance. <laughs> the light from the Venetian blinds, the autumn silver Kansas light lazing the table that Sunday is what I recall now because it was beautiful, though I, of course, would not have said so then, beautiful as so many moments forgotten but later remembered come back to us in slants and pools and uprisings of light, beautiful in itself, but more beautiful mingled with memory. The light leaning across my mother's carefully set table, across the empty chair beside my Uncle Ross, the light filtering down from the green plastic slats in the roof of the machine shop where I worked with my father so many afternoons, standing or crouched in pools of light and sweat with men who knew the true meaning of labor and money and other hard, true things, and did not, did not ever use the word beauty. <clears throat> Late November, shadows gather in the shop's north end and I'm watching Bobby Suddeth do piecework on the Hobbs. The Hobbs is the easiest lathe machine in the shop to work. He fouls another cut, motherfucker, fucking bitch machine, and starts over sloppy, slow, about two joints away from being fired, but he just doesn't give a shit. He sets the bit again, white wrist flashing in the lamplight and showing botched, blurred tattoos, both from a night in Tijuana, and continues his sexual autobiography. <laughs> That's right, fuck my own sister, and I'll tell you, bud, it wasn't bad. <laughs> Later in the Philippines, the clap. As far as I'm concerned, any man who hasn't had BD just isn't a man. <laughs> I walk away knowing I have just heard the dumbest remark ever, <laughs> ever uttered by man or animal. <laughs> the air around me hums in a dark metallic bass, light spilling like grails of milk as someone opens the mammoth shop door. 
A shrill, sullen truculence blows in like dust devils, the hot wind nagging my blousy overalls, and in the side yard, the winch truck backfires and stalls. The sky yellows, barn sparrows cry in the rafters. That afternoon in Dallas, Kennedy is shot. Two weeks later, sitting around on rotary tables and traveling blocks whose bearings litter the shop floor like huge eggs, we close our lunch boxes and lean back with cigarettes and watch smoke and dust motes rise and drift into sunlight. All of us have seen the newscast. The photographs from life have sat there in our cavernous rooms, assassinations, and crowds flickering over our faces. Some of us have even dreamed it, sleeping through the TV's drone and flutter, seeing her arm reaching across the lank body, black suits rushing in like mobs, and the long snake of the motorcade come to rest, then the announcer's voice as we wake astonished in the dark. We think of it now, staring at the tin ceiling like a giant screen, what a strange goddamn country. As Bobby Suddeth arches a wadded Fritos bag at the time clock and says, Oswald, from that far, you got to admit, that shot was a beauty. <clears throat> the following summer, a black Corvette gleams like a slice of onyx in the side yard, driven there by two young men who look like Marlon Brando and mention Hollywood when Bobby asks where they're from. The foreman, my father, has hired them because we're backed up with work, both shop and yard strewn with rig parts, flatbed haulers rumbling in each day, lugging damaged draw works, and we are desperate. The noise is awful. A gang of roughnecks from a rig on downtime shouting orders. Our floor hands knee deep in the draw works gears, heating the frozen sleeves and bushings with cutting torches until they can be hammered loose. The iron shell bangs back like a drumhead. Looking for some peace, I walk onto the pipe rack for a quick smoke. And this is the way it begins for me, this memory, this strangest of all memories of the shop and the men who work there, because the silence has come upon me like the shadow of cranes flying overhead as they would each autumn, like the quiet and imperceptible turning of a season, the shop has grown suddenly still here in the middle of the workday, and I turn to look through the tall doors for the machinists stand now with their backs to me, the lathes whining down together, and in the shop center I see them, standing in a square of light, the two men from California, as the welders lift their black masks looking up, and I see their faces first, the expressions of children at a zoo, perhaps, or after a first snow. As the two men stand naked, their clothes in little piles on the floor as if they were about to go swimming. And I recall how fragile and pale their bodies seemed against the iron and steel of the drill presses and milling machines and lathes. I did not know the word exhibitionist then, and so for a moment it seemed only a problem of memory, that they had forgotten somehow where they were that this was not the locker room after the game, that they were not taking a shower, that this was not the appropriate place, and they would then remember and suddenly embarrassed begin shyly to dress again. But they did not. And in memory they stand frozen and poised as two models in a drawing class of whom the finished sketch might be said, though not by me, nor any man I knew, to be beautiful they stand there forever. Lost my place. They stand there forever, 
with the time clock ticking behind them, time running on but not moving, like the white tunnel of silence between the snap of the ball and the thunderclap of shoulder pads that never seems to come, and then there it is. And I hear a quick intake of breath on my right behind the hobs, and it is Bobby Suddeth with what I think now was not just anger, but a kind of terror on his face, an animal wildness in the eyes and the jaw tight, making ropes in his neck while in a long blur with his left hand raised and gripping an iron file, he is moving toward the men who wait attentive and motionless as deer trembling in a clearing. And instantly there is my father between Bobby and the men as if he were waking them after a long sleep, reaching out to touch the shoulder of the blonde one as he says in a voice almost terrible in its gentleness, its discretion, you boys will have to leave now. He takes one look at Bobby who is shrinking back into the shadows of the hobs, then walks quickly back to his office at the front of the shop and soon the black Corvette with the orange California plates is squealing onto Highway 54, heading west into the sun. So there they are, as I will always remember them. The men who were once fullbacks or tackles or guards in their three-point stances knuckling into the mud, hungry for high school glory and the pride of their fathers, eager to gallop terribly against each other's bodies, each man in his body, looking out now at the nakedness of a body like his, men who each autumn had followed their fathers into the pheasant-rich fields of Kansas, and as boys had climbed down from the Alice Chalmers after plowing their first straight furrow, licking the dirt from their lips, the hand of the father resting lightly upon their shoulder, Men who in the oven-warm winter kitchens of Baptist households saw after a bath the body of the father and felt diminished by it. Who that same winter in the abandoned schoolyard felt the odd intimacy of their fists against the larger boy's cheekbone but kept hitting ferociously and walked away feeling for the first time the strength, the abundance of their own bodies. And I imagine the men that evening after the strangest day of their lives, after they have left the shop without speaking and made the long drive home alone in their pickups, I see them in their little white frame houses on the edge of town, adrift in the long silence of the evening, turning finally to their wives, touching without speaking the hair which she has learned to let fall about her shoulders at this hour of night, lifting the white nightgown from her body as she in turn unbuttons his work shirt, heavy with the sweat and grease of the day's labor, until they stand naked before each other and begin to touch in a slow choreography of familiar gestures their bodies, she touching his chest, his hand brushing her breasts, and he does not say the word beautiful because he cannot and never has. And she does not say it because it would embarrass him or any other man she has ever known, though it is precisely the word I am thinking now as I stand before Donatello's David with my wife touching my sleeve. What are you thinking? And I think of the letter from my father years ago describing the death of Bobby Suddeth, a single shot from a 12 gauge which he held against his chest. The death of the heart, I suppose, a kind of terrible beauty, as someone said, of the death of Hart Crane, though that is surely a perverse use of the word. And I was stunned then, thinking of the damage men will visit upon their bodies. What are you thinking, she asked again. And so I began to tell her <clears throat> about a strange afternoon in Kansas, about something I have never spoken of. And we walked to a window where the shifting light spreads a sheen along the casement. And looking out, 
We see the city blazing like miles of uncut wheat, the farthest buildings taken in their turn, and the great dome, the way the metal roof of the machine shop, I tell her, would break into flame late on an autumn day with such beauty. Thank you. Thank you.